Welcome to this revision catch-up presentation on the inquiry question, did the Normans bring a truckload of trouble to England in 1066? So we'll start off by just focusing on when the Norman conquest was. So the Norman period began in the year 1066. So 1066 is one of the most important events in English history. And you can see where there where we have plotted um, the red cross on the timeline that shows you when 1066 was. And you can see that this is seen as such an important year in history that we use this to mark the start of what we call medieval times in 1066 and this is seen as the end of the anglo-saxon time period with the death of course of harold godwinson at the battle of hastings on the 14th of october 1066 it's one of those events in history that has real significance and certainly changed the course of the history of this country so that is when um, the Norman conquest took place um, after 1066. Um, William, Duke of Normandy, who would then become King William I, known, of course, as William the Conqueror, he ruled from 1066 until 1087. And the Norman period is generally regarded as lasting until 1154. So there's a reminder there of where the Norman conquest fits in with all the other historical time periods we've been looking at. And just a reminder of some of those key information about chronology that we've been learning about as well. So our inquiry question is around the idea that the Normans brought a truckload of trouble to England in 1066. This is a metaphor used by the historian Simon Sharma, who is pictured there to describe that the Normans brought lots of trouble, lots of chaos, huge amounts of change um, to the Anglo-Saxon people that were living uh, in England up to 1066. Um, it's important to note that they didn't actually have trucks um, as we might regard them nowadays in 1066, but it's a nice phrase for us to think about the impact of the Norman Conquest. So the historian Simon Sharma has written about the Norman Conquest. He has, of course, used historical sources to come up with his interpretation of the Norman Conquest. And we're using our knowledge of this inquiry to think about whether we would agree or disagree with his interpretation and why. So this is his quote from his book, A History of Britain, written in 2000. He said, historians like a quiet life and usually they get it. For the most part, history moves at deliberate pace, working its changes subtly and incrementally. Nations and their institutions harden into shape or crumble away like sediment carried by the flow of a sluggish river. English history in particular seems the work of a temperate community, seldom shaken by convulsions. But there are moments when history is unsubtle, when change arrives in a violent rush, decisive, bloody, traumatic, as a truckload of trouble, wiping out everything that gives a culture its bearings, custom, language, law, loyalty. 1066 was one of those moments. So what a fantastic historical interpretation for us to use to drive our inquiry forward. So some key concepts and some key words that we've looked at in this inquiry, um, which is important for you to be able to remember. So first word, authority, the ability to give orders and control people. Anglo-Saxon, so the name that we give to the people living in England before the Norman Conquest, such as Harold Godwinson, who was an Anglo-Saxon king. Archbishop, a senior leader in the church. The Archbishop of Canterbury was the most senior churchman in England. A chronicle, such as the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. It's an historical source which tells the story of historical events. Conquer, to take control of a place, usually by force. This is known as a conquest. Feudal system, a system of hierarchy with a king at the top, which kept control of people in Norman England. Freeman, a type of peasant who was free to leave the village and rented land from Normans. Harrying of the North. This is an event from 1069 to 1070 when the Normans brutally destroyed large parts of the North, killing up to 100,000 people. Interpretation. The view of a historian formed by using historical sources. A knight, a soldier who fought on horseback and would fight for their lord or the king. The lord of the manor, the person above you in the feudal system. A manor means an area of land. Monastery, a place where monks or nuns live. They devote their life to prayer and to their religion. A peasant, a poor person who lives and works in the countryside. Peasants could be villains or freemen. Resistance, when people protest or rebel, such as the Saxons resisted Norman rule. 
Source, evidence from the time of an event, such as the Chronicle or the Bayer Tapestry. A villain, a type of peasant that was tied to the land and had to work for the lord of the manor. So in our inquiry, we've looked at four different lessons to help us to um, assess and evaluate the historical interpretation from Simon Sharma. Did the Normans bring a truckload of trouble to England in 1066? So the four lessons we've looked at uh, were the first one. Were the Normans fair or brutal to England, 1066 to 1071? Did the Normans have a positive impact on society? Were Norman castles a truckload of trouble? And did Norman rule bring a truckload of trouble to England? So in our first lesson, we looked at the key question, were the Normans fair or brutal to England between 1066 and 1071? So we learned that the Normans began their conquest of England after winning the Battle of Hastings. So even though the Normans had won the Battle of Hastings and King Harold Godwinson had been killed, it didn't mean that the Normans had gained control over the whole country. So what the Normans did first of all is they took control of London by surrounding it and persuading the city to surrender. And William was crowned at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day and he became King William I of England, um, popularly known as William the Conqueror. Now, it's no surprise that the rebellions against um, Norman rule began in 1067 and it began in the west part of the country. And this is because Harold Godwinson, who had been the previous King of England and an Anglo-Saxon King of England, had been the Earl of Wessex, which is over in that southwestern part of the country. So the first rebellions took place um, in 1067 when Edric the Wild led an attack on the city of Hereford. William stayed out of it and let the attack fade away. So we talked about how that was probably a fair way of dealing with it. And he didn't go in all brutal straight away. Um, there was then um, in over in Exeter, um, you can see that on the map, Goethe, the mother of Harold Godwinson, had taken refuge in Exeter and was building an army to resist. William laid siege to the city for 18 days to bring about an end to that rebellion. The next plots um, arose in the north. So there were various plots that took place in the north in 1068 and 1069. Um, William um, went north to face them. He built castles to demonstrate his power rather than fighting them directly. Um, so he was using castles to show his power and influence and be able to base his soldiers. We talked about how that was perhaps not as brutal as he could have been. But then we talked about how some strong evidence for the Normans being quite brutal and therefore bringing uh, a truckload of trouble was some of the rebellions in the north in 1069 led to what was called the harrying of the north. Now the harrying of the north was basically when Norman soldiers um, laid waste um, to huge areas of the north, um, north of the River Humber, um, as far north as the River Tees. So the area that we are in, in Yorkshire, for example, was laid waste. Salt was ploughed into the land to destroy crops. Animals were, were killed uh, and essentially lots and lots of people died in the harrying of the north from starvation. Historians don't know for sure, but they estimate that up to 100,000 people could have died and many people became refugees and had to leave the north. Um, evidence of the Doomsday Book from 1086 shows just how devastating the north had been and particularly around the area of Helmsley, for example, Elmerslack. There's strong evidence to suggest that area had been devastated and very much destroyed by the Norman conquest. So in lesson two, we looked at whether the Normans had had a positive impact on society, on individual people. So we looked at how the feudal system worked. Now, the feudal system is a system of hierarchy. Now, a hierarchy means that some people are seen as being more important than the others. So at the top of the feudal system was the monarch. In this case, of course, with the Norman conquest, it was King William I. He owned all the land, um, but he loaned out manors, which are areas of land, to what were called tenants in chief, who were the most important people in um, society at the time, what are called the barons and the bishops. Um, the tenants in the chief, they then rented or loaned out some of that land to what were called the subtenants, who were people like knights, who were soldiers that fought on horseback. And the other members of the clergy, the, the priests that weren't seen as being the most important priests, the, the bishops are generally the sort of um, ones that are in charge. So the subtenants then rented or loaned lands to the peasants below them. Now, peasants um, in the Norman era were known as either freemen or villains. And we'll talk about that more in a, in a minute. And there's about a million of those. So most people in Norman England were peasants. So basically what happened is the monarch took control, King William took control of all of the land 
in England, but then he was able to rent it out to those people below him in the feudal system. So in return, the peasants farmed the land and they gave up their freedom. Some um, peasants were able to pay rent to the lords. Um, and what they got in return is they got the ability to farm the land, to be able to feed themselves and their families. And they also got protection as well from the, from the knights above them from any sort of attacks or invasions, etc. Which bearing in mind that some of these people had lived through Viking attacks before was probably, you know, a good thing. Um, the subtenants, um, they agreed to fight for the people above them. Um, so anyone above you in the feudal system was known as your lord. They also paid rent. And then the tenants in chief, they were expected to gather together an army for the king if he needed it. They also um, would pay rents. So essentially what King William was getting from the feudal system, he was, he was giving out land and in return he was getting lots of money and he became incredibly wealthy. And he also got in return soldiers to fight for him. And we also get a system of hierarchy to keep people just generally under control. So in terms of the general impact on people, the Normans abolished slavery, which had existed in Anglo-Saxon times. Um, we also talked about how women lost lands to the Normans. They were sometimes forced to marry uh, Normans as well. Um, the Normans took nearly all land. So hardly any um, Anglo-Saxon people that had owned land were able to keep their land after the Norman conquest. Freemen were poor peasants who rented land and were free, but as the Normans raised the rent so high, many had to become villains in order to survive. And villains were peasants who were not free and they were tied to the land. So this meant they needed permission of um, the person above them in the feudal system to leave the village or indeed to get married, for example. So lots of restrictions put on people's lives. So that shows quite strong evidence that the Normans did I think bring a truckload of trouble, but there were some examples of perhaps um, some people that gained a little bit from the Norman conquest. So the next lesson we looked at was whether Norman castles brought a truckload of trouble. So we talked about um, how the Normans built castles across England and how they were used as military fortresses, but often as well just to show off Norman power. They would have been feared by the Anglo-Saxons and seen as instruments of control. We then looked at some case studies of different Norman castles, talked about how the Normans built over a thousand castles. We talked about Chepstow Castle in Wales being built on the Welsh marches. Marches means border um, to defend against attacks from the Welsh. We talked about Old Sarum Castle near Salisbury, which is a huge castle with one of the, the biggest baileys in England. The whole town would have been contained with in it. Um, we talked about Elmy Castle in Worcestershire, which was an average sized castle. There's a few remains of that that exist nowadays, which suggests that it might not have been particularly well built and might not have been a particularly strong military fortress. And then we talked about nearby Richmond Castle, which was built after the Harrying of the North in order to keep control of that area of the North. And that was built by Alan the Red, who was a Norman, built on a very um, strong hilltop position overlooking the River Swale, Richmond Castle. Um, it comes from the French phrase Richemont, which means strong hill. We then looked at whether the new laws that the Normans brought in, the idea of Norman rule, brought a truckload of trouble. Um, so we talked about the Murdrum Law, which was a new law which meant an entire village could be fined if a Norman was killed and the attacker could not be, be actually be found. We talked about how the Forest Law punished Anglo-Saxons severely if they entered the Royal Forest without permission. So that stopped people being able to hunt in the forests or forage food in the forest. So that restricted people's freedoms. We talked about trial of combat was a new way of deciding if a person was guilty by making them take part in some kind of uh, combat, showed the Normans love for all things military. We talked about how Normans made the taxes really high so that many freemen were forced to become villains, so they lost their freedom. We also talked about how the Normans reformed the church, helping to end corruption and bringing in laws to improve people's moral behaviour. We talked about how the Normans built lots of monasteries. Uh, in 1066, there were about 60 monasteries, but by 1135, there were 235, and the monasteries often cared for and helped the poor and the sick. And then we also took, talked about how the Normans took over almost all positions of authority. In fact, authority itself is a French word. Only one in 16 English bishops remained in post. Norman words entered the English language, such as authority, government, royal agreement and evidence. And then to help your historical explanation, we've looked at other sources and historians and what they think about the Norman Conquest. So historian Mark Morris has said, even as they were making life more miserable for those who'd once been free, the Normans were dramatically improving the fortunes of those who had not. So a balanced um, interpretation there. 
Um, we talked about how um, William of Malmesbury in the early 12th century said England had become the dwelling place of foreigners and the playground of lords of alien blood. No Englishman today is an earl, a bishop or an abbot. New faces everywhere enjoy England's riches and nor at her vitals. So this talks about how um, with the Norman conquest, the Normans basically replaced the Anglo-Saxons in all positions of authority. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicle said they built castles far and wide throughout the land, oppressing, which means sort of controlling the unhappy people. So that suggests there is quite a truckload of trouble. And the historian George Garnett said 1066 ushered in change of a magnitude and at a speed unparalleled in English history. So that's getting us to help us think about the concept of significance and about how important um, 1066 was because it brought in such a huge amount of change and that people recognise that at the time. And then the Doomsday Book, um, a famous doomsday entry for Marsh Gibbon in Buckinghamshire, notes that his English farmer, Ethelric, used to hold his land freely, but now holds it, quote, in heaviness and misery. So some really interesting uh, sources there. Sources are evidence from the time and then historians are people that use historians um, to come up with their own interpretation. So people like Mark Morris, George Garnett, for example, uh, Simon Sharma, who we've studied, are interpretations. So we've looked at that revision video. What's your final opinion to this historical question then? Do you think that the Normans did bring a truckload of trouble to England in 1066 or not? Do you agree with Simon Sharma? And the crucial thing here is that if you are agreeing with him or you are disagreeing with him, that you have some good historical evidence and good knowledge to be able to support what you think about this question. Thanks very much for listening. Bye bye.